195, 195, nothing but the blood of Jesus. If you'll step up here and pray with us, please, sir, if you will. And uh, we're glad you're here. Others will be coming in, the Lord willing. Appreciate everybody making their way out here on Wednesday night and being faithful to the Lord. Good to see Brother Plasters. God bless you. Glad you're feeling better, but I know you're not up to par. Glad you are here, uh, able to be with us tonight in church. Brother Douglas, if you'll pray with us, please, sir. Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord, today to thank you for this blessing of being in church today. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to gather and read your word. Lord, please be with the preacher as uh, he preaches and gives us the word, hide him behind the cross, and just soften our hearts to the word, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, remain standing. All right, let's sing it. 192, the blood will never lose its power. We'll sing it out.
gonna play a verse or two. We're gonna shake hands. Welcome Brother Cooper tonight, back in from California. Glad he's here. He's gonna preach in just a little bit, the Lord willing. Right now, shake hands one with another, all right? Go ahead and play for us. much quickly let me give you some announcements they're going to get ready to sing for us uh, we have the new may and june baptist bread in they're down front they're on the side table so uh a little bit of ring brother philip but uh you get one uh, that'll help you in your daily devotional life appreciate that now tomorrow night this is brand new for everybody so we're opening up for everybody we thought the van would be in the van's not in we wish it was in but probably going to be monday maybe friday or saturday but probably monday so uh we'll have to take a couple vehicles but uh, we're gonna go, we're gonna leave from that bus parking lot at 5.30 sharp, okay, 5.30 sharp. We're going up to Statesville, North Carolina. Brother Chris Hazlip's church, you, many of you know him. Heard him at uh, Gateway Jubilee for years and years. They're having a jubilee, and Brother Cooper's preaching tomorrow night. That service starts at 7.30, all right? That's why we need to leave at 5.30. If you wanna go, just meet us over here. We'll get in as many vehicles as we need to, and we'll go, okay? And so, uh, that, again, 5.30 tomorrow night. Keep that in mind. And then I want, I want you to come up now, Brother Landon. Come on up right now. Let's take care of this. This is important. This is not too far away. And uh, I need the salesman up here, all right? I want the salesman to come up here. We're going to talk about the revolutionary run just for a minute, all right? All right. Thank you, Preacher. Just uh, going back over what we did Sunday, I know some have already left. Some were still out for spring break. But the revolutionary run will be April 27th, so just a couple weeks away. Um, sneaking up on us quickly. Um, we need those to we need those who want to participate to register. Even if you are doing a sponsorship, you still need to fill out a registration form. So I have your shirt size, your age, the brackets, all that sort of stuff we fill out. So 
if you could get those to me, we need sponsors. Um, you know, I know we are pushed for time, but obviously we have to get the shirts printed, get all everything else worked out. So if you or your company or someone you know or whoever wants to sponsor in the run and whatever amount they can, there's three or four different levels they can sponsor at. But if you can sponsor and help us out, just get that money to me and get that form to me as quickly as you can so we can get those on the shirts and the banner. And like I said, we need everyone to sign up. It's going to be a beautiful spring day. I saw already next Saturday it's going to be like 86 degrees, 87. So we're going to look for a beautiful spring day. It's a nice park. No cars, no traffic. We get there. We just walk around, have a good time. Those who want to run, run. Those who want to walk, walk. But if you can get there and bring your kids, bring all the students, you come participate. We want everyone who can to show up for the Revolutionary Run. So if you have questions, just see me, and we appreciate everyone's support. Amen. All right. Thank you, Brother Landon. All right. A couple other dates. Y'all go ahead and get ready, Brother Cam. We'll get the preacher up here in a minute. But uh, I want you to remember the uh, baptismal service, April 21st. If you are a believer and you've been saved and you've never been scripturally baptized, you need to see myself from Ms. Cooper and let us know that you're going to be a candidate for baptism. And then uh, I want you to write April, not April, no, I want you to write, uh, let me find the date, uh, where'd it go here? Well, the, um, the musical, there you go, April 19th. I want you to write that down, all right? April 19th is the big uh, Once Upon a Story Night. That'll be at the gymnasium put on by the school. So write that down, April 19th, all right? Come on, y'all. They're going to sing for us. Appreciate this family, all right? God bless you. mind gets so fixed by the world that we're in my battles and struggles and the heartache of sin oh satan's attacked the church of today they've left god's old they found a new way but thank God for the altar that's where I got in that old time conviction revealed all my sin that old King James Bible it still works today was raised in the old-fashioned way. That old-fashioned preacher, they say he must go. Just give us a smooth one who puts on a show. Don't sing us those old songs about dark cavalry. Just give us a new song and happy we'll be. But I'd like to tell you I'm not going that way. I'll stay with the blood and the price Jesus paid. I was born in the fire and the smoke will not do. I'm a walking the old past. Brother, how about you? And thank God for the altar. today. Thank God I was raised in the old-fashioned way. And thank God for the altar. That's where I got in. That old-time conviction revealed all my sin. 
King James Bible. It still works today. Thank God I was raised in the old-fashioned way. Thank God I was raised in the old-fashioned way. beyond measure, amen. A lot of the world has not the foggiest idea what in the world that song is even talking about. Aren't you glad God bless you? Let you be born into fire, amen. And I tell you, the smoke just won't do. Will not do. We do have some sickness tonight, several out because they're not well, so pray for those that you see that are not here. And then um, Brother Dwayne Wagner had the heart surgery and was able to go home this morning, wasn't it? Well, this morning, yes. This morning, he's home resting. Pray for him, all right? Good to have the preacher back in the house tonight from uh, traveling. And I know he's got to leave again Thursday. I guess he's got to leave again Friday or Saturday. 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 Got to leave again Saturday. Bless his heart. So I figured we'd scoop him up while he's here. And he's here. And he's no stranger. Evangelist Justin Cooper, all right? All right, take your Bible and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 tonight. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And then we'll also read in chapter 8 and then a couple verses in chapter number 10. And it's good to be back home tonight. I've been out of town for a, a few days and in a different time zone. And that three-hour thing gets harder the older that I get. And uh, so I'm glad to be back. Somebody said, how was it out there? I said, good. I got some heroin, slept in a box. It's California, you know. But the, anyway, we had a, good, had a good visit, but glad to be back here in America tonight. And I've enjoyed the service. Uh, I had uh, so many people there. I mean... I don't know if it was 100 or not, but it was close. Say, yeah, we watch your services out there and things. So that's a blessing, isn't it? And uh, many of them are already looking for homes here. So that's good. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. And I pray this will be a help and a blessing to us tonight. And it might seem and sound more like a, a Bible study than it does just a sermon. Uh, but I think it will be helpful. I know it will be because it's the Word of God. And also it's something that I think that I see people struggle with and battle with. And if we can get a hold of this, it'll fix a lot of things in my life and in yours as well. So I want you to see this tonight. First Corinthians chapter number six, verse number 12. It's good to have Caleb Chisholm here tonight. Caleb, glad you're here. And I uh, thank God the juvenile center gives them leave just for little windows of time. And uh, so he's here tonight. If there's a beep, it's his ankle and we'll get him to his parole officer. First Corinthians chapter number six and verse number 12. The Bible says this, look at what your Bible says. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I'll not be brought under the power of any. Take your Bible, go to chapter 8 and verse number 9. I want you to see what the Bible says. See what it says in verse number 9? But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. All right, now chapter number 10, verse number 23. Here's what your Bible says. All things are lawful for me. Now that's where most people say, amen, let's go to the house. But that's not where the Bible stops. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. Now today I was, uh, the plane was late from Ca California to Atlanta. And so I barely made my connection. I made it, and I was afraid my bag wouldn't make it, the checked bag. The checked bag did make it, and there was a tag on it, and it said expedited baggage. That word expedite means to rush ahead on the journey. What he's saying is everything, you have enough grace to do whatever you want to do, and you will not lose your salvation. But not everything that you do is going to hurry you on the journey to Christ-likeness. Not all of it edifies, not all of it helps, not all of it is beneficial. All things are lawful, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. And then verse 31 is the key. Look what it says. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. I want to speak to you a little while tonight on this thought of expediency and excess. 
expediency and excess. Let's pray. God, I need your help. I pray that you'd help us to be clear, and I pray that we'd uh, uh, present the truth, God, in a way that we can get a hold of it. I pray the Holy Spirit would use this in my life and in the life of our church tonight that would glorify and honor you in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're living in days of identity crisis. It's all over our country. It's all over the world. People are looking at themselves and thinking, who am I? And they're searching for identity. Uh, they have a quarter-life crisis. There's a midlife crisis. People have marital crisis. They have career crisis. Today we have gender crisis where somebody will look at themselves in the mirror and think maybe God got it wrong and now they wonder maybe I should have been this, that, or the other. And I, I saw somebody there in California at a, at a Starbucks and of course I know I was in intimate territory, I'd expect it. But when I walked into that place, uh, the person had a badge on their vest and it said, my pronouns are... And I wanted to say it, I ought to say dumber or dumb and dumber. My pronouns are. Uh, but uh, you'll look if you study that suicide rates are higher than ever before. And uh, social media abuse, everybody lives for a, a, a smiley face hugging a heart or a thumb up on their post of them eating spaghetti and depression's at an all time high. Everybody's bitter and angry. And they say 37% of teenagers are battling with their identity. Now, that might be the case with people out in the world, but I want you to hear something. A Christian ought not ever struggle with their identity. Our identity died and then birthed again when we got saved. Our identity is gone and now Jesus Christ is my identity in Titus 1 and verse 15 here's what the first part of that verse is listen to me under the pure all things are pure Galatians 5 1 the first part of the verse says stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free Galatians 5 13 a Paul said for brethren ye have been called unto liberty 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 1, Paul said, Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? And I see that trend today where the average Christian is looking for an excuse to live in a way outside the boundary of the Bible. And they're taking their liberty and using it almost like a license to live in sin. And here's what they're doing. They're struggling to maintain their old identity and to suppress the new one. When you were saved, that old man ought to be reckoned dead and we had to live in the new man. So let's talk about identity for a little while. People say, here's my identity. I'm funny. My identity is I'm smart. My identity, I identify as athletic. I identify as successful. But as a Christian, our identity is just that. We are a Christian. So I want us to think about that tonight kind of practically about our responsibility. Now here it is. Tonight as a Christian, you're an ambassador for Christ. As an ambassador, you're a representative of a larger entity. An ambassador represents something that is more powerful than himself. He represents something that is bigger than himself. He stands for something that is more important than himself. As an ambassador, he is no longer his own. His words are not just his words. His decisions are not just his decisions. His actions are no longer just his actions. But everything he does is yoked to that larger body that he stands in front of and represents to the world. Whether it be a state, whether it be a nation, no matter what it is, an ambassador represents represents something far bigger than himself. Now, here's what he does. Now, he has to filter every thought through whatever it is he represents. Now, he ought to filter every word through whatever it is that he represents. He has to respond to different situations through the filter of whatever it is he represents. When he accepted the position as an ambassador, he was saying, I will die to myself and live for whatever it is that I am representing. 2 Corinthians 5.20, Paul wrote, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. What he's saying is the life that we live as a Christian is a life that has the expectation that it reflects and represents Jesus Christ to the world around us. After salvation, your identity changed. Now you're a new creature. Old things are to be passed away. You went from lost 
to saved. You went from a child of hell to a child of God. You went from condemned to redeemed. You went from just another sinner to now a son of God and a Christian in this world. And salvation birthed you and I in the business of being an ambassador. I don't just simply represent me. I don't just simply represent my family. I represent something far bigger than that. I am a representative of Jesus Christ. Galatians 2.20, for I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. If you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God. God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. No man that warreth entangleth himself in the affairs of this life, that it may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. I want you to hear the statement. The mature Christian life is not me, me, me. It is not self, self, self. But spiritual maturity is daily crucifixion, and it is all about the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. The ambassador for Christ understands there's a difference in excess and expediency. Just because I can do it doesn't mean I ought to do it. And I'm convinced that I see this at work in Christianity across America today where folks are not worried about the Lord. They're not real worried about their church, but they're very wrapped up in themselves and will make fun of the Catholic for being an idolater and will mock the, the athlete for being an idolater, but the Christian at large is as much an idolater as the one bowing before a statue. They do not idolize statue. They might not idolize a sport, but they're idolizing themselves and saying, I don't care what God says. I have liberty to live however I want to live. Spiritual immaturity is always battling to maintain its old identity. They want salvation, but not sanctification. They want the promise of heaven, but no self-denial. They want to be a Christian, but they don't want to wash anybody else's feet. They want to wear a crown, but they will not bear a cross. They will not be selfless, but they are selfish. Spiritual immaturity is wrapped up in the flesh. Everything about it is for me. Everything about it is what brings me pleasure. Everything about it is what tantalizes my senses and we cater to the carnal. But the spiritual mature Christian is this, Christ, 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 Bible, 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 others, others, others. And the immature Christian is me, me, me. My opinion, my truth, my feelings, my thoughts. That's the epitome of being a baby. All right, you ready now? I won't name a name because he's in the service and he's the only one I got so he'll know who I'm talking about. But you have a kid. It is not surprising to hear them say, I want to eat this, I don't want to eat that. I want that toy, I don't want to go there. I don't want to clean my room, I don't want, and it's all I don't or I do or me or my, that's a shame. I mean, it's all right when a child does it, but it's a shame to see a bunch of 40-year-old and up Christian folk that live that way spiritually, and they say, well, I don't want to do that, and I don't want to go here, and I don't like the way you preach, and I don't like that kind of singing. That is spiritual immaturity. Paul preached against that throughout his epistles, and Christ gave us the antithesis of that by his own example. We are to die to ourselves. It is not about me. It's about the Lord. Compromise always goes halfway down the Bible path. It never goes all the way. And that's the problem with those verses I read. They're all good Bible verses, but we only read half. And the average person today loves the first part, but here it is in whole Galatians 5.13. For brethren, you've been called unto liberty. Hallelujah, I got liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Here's what I want you to hear. Liberty is always attached to responsibility. The two work together. You don't have liberty without it because our liberty is to bring God glory. Romans 14, 7. No man liveth to himself. No man will die to himself. I am not under the demands of the law, but I ought to be under the impulse of the Holy Spirit. 
I don't need Moses, but I have a master. I don't need the law, but I've got a Lord. I don't go to Mount Sinai, but I have the Holy Spirit. First Peter said, uh, First Peter 2, 16, as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. He's saying, man, you're free to do whatever you want, but you ought not use your liberty because of grace to go out there and do things that are wicked and anti-God. The cause for all this is we're to glorify Christ. Colossians 1.18, that in all things you might have the preeminence. Now listen, I'm going slow. Christianity is not about seeing how close to the edge I can run and not fall off. Everybody all right? Christianity is not about running as close to the edge as I can and not falling off. It's about how close can I get to Christ and how much glory can I bring to his name. First Peter 4, 4, wherein they think it's strange that you run not with them to the excess of right, speaking evil of you. Here it is, the Christian ought not run with the world. The Christian does not run like the world. The Christian does not run to the world. The world operates in the realm of excess, but the Christian lives in the realm of expediency. My citizen and I, citizenship tonight. My name, my father, my association, it is not temporal or earthly. It is eternal and in heaven. And tonight if you're saved, you owe a debt to your Savior. Not to live like you're lost. Not to live like the world. Not to live like the lost crowd. But to bring glory to his name in everything. If you're eating, if you're drinking, if you're sleeping, if you're awake, that God might be magnified and glorified with your life. My identity is anchored in Christ. I see this out of pastors today in my age bracket. These little arrogant uh, pastors that have gotten pulpits built by a man of God that was a real man of God. And now they've taken that church. And I have no respect for some religious rebel that wears a clerical robe and flaunts his liberty and uses it a licentious way and lords over people with it. Here's what they do. They get as close to the edge as possible and say, I'm under grace. That's not Bible grace. Grace is not ungodly. The grace of God teaches me to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. My appearance ought to reflect that I love the Lord. My worship ought to reflect that I love the Lord. My, uh, my speech ought to reflect I love the Lord. Now listen, my schedule ought to reflect that I love the Lord. It's a shame how easily Christians skip church on Sunday to go to a whatever. Don't be upset when your children don't want God. My activities ought to reflect I love the Lord. My plans, my associations all spin from a love for the Lord. It's an indictment against how shallow we are spiritually and how carnal we are that saved people are more interested in what they can do than what they should do. I don't need a whole lot of amens because I want to make sure I'm preaching right. We filter so much of our life through the concept of I'm allowed to do it instead of is this going to glorify God if I do it. 1 Corinthians 6, 12, again, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I'll not be brought under the power of any. And it's amazing, the folks who say they're the most free are the most in bondage. Well, I'm free now. I'll dress how I want. Yeah, but you don't. You dress to keep up with the model on the television or the celebrity in the movie. I mean, that's how you're, you're in bondage to that. I'm free. I'll do what I want. You're not free. You're in bondage to the liquor bottle. You're in bondage to the fornication. You're in bondage to whatever it is. And you say you're free. That's not freedom. That's the yoke of bondage. You're going back to the weak and beggarly elements of this world. Christ has made us free not to live in sin, but thank God free to serve him. Just because you're under grace doesn't mean we can redefine sin. Just because the world accepts it doesn't mean God does. Just because we're backslidden Christian friends that don't go to church say it's all right doesn't mean the Bible does. There's a lot of talk about liberty, but I don't hear a lot about responsibility. Here's why. Liberty is about me. Responsibility is about Jesus. Liberty is about self. Responsibility is about others. Liberty is about I'm allowed to do it so it doesn't matter what you say. Responsibility, he says, I want to know what God has to say. So modern Christians take half a Bible verse and use it to live how they want. They hold tight to the first part. They let the old man live and do as he pleases and still want to act like they're spiritual. Just because you can type a spiritual post on Facebook doesn't mean you're spiritual. Here's what I hear. I have liberty. I'll watch what I want. 
That sounds like a baby. I have liberty. I'm free in Jesus. I'll wear what I want. We're going to talk about it. I'm no longer in bondage. I'll do church how I want. I'm under grace. I can act how I want. I'm not just free from sin. Now I'm free to sin. I'm not just free from the world. I'm free to be like the world. And here's what they're preaching, a perverted grace that is not found in the Bible. Spiritual immaturity produces a blurry ambassadorship. It takes the old landmarks and moves them and so that those looking upon the church and the Christian do not see a clear picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything about our life ought to tell the world that he is holy, that he is lovely, that he is powerful, and he's mighty to save. The world doesn't need to see another half-baked, carnal, dead Christian. They need to see Christ in you, the hope of glory. At the root of this motivation to manipulate liberty is this, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a desire to sin. Because really what it does, it puts the flesh over the spirit. Sin is always self-motivated. Now I want to get it, I, I want to get it, I saw this the other, last night at the airport, this girl was walking down we got plenty of time. I'm, I'm, I'm glad and you're probably not. But we, I was walking down the airport last night and this girl had on a sweater and it said this, more self-love. That is not what we need. I see Christians using that phrase. Well, I just need a me day. You got too many me days. That's why we don't have revival. Well, we just need more self-love. You love yourself too much as it is, and that's why we don't have revival. Well, I just need some time for me. What do you mean all your time is for you already, and that's why we don't have revival? And I'm afraid that's what we're seeing in this modern church movement in America. It's just a seeker-sensitive, condition to the wants of the crowd kind of Christianity, and that's why it's dead and it's shallow and there's no power in it. We don't need more self-love. We need more self-crucifixion, more self-denial. That's what we need in this day. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it's a chapter of identification. If you study out the chapter, really the crux of it, the reason Paul writes it is verse 31. He tells us whether you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Now listen, that is the goal for your life. The reason you're breathing air tonight is to glorify God. It is not to make money. Amen. It is not just to live a happy life, though that is the happiest life. It is to bring glory to God. In verse 23, here's what he said. All things are lawful for me. That means I can do whatever I want. But all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me. I can do whatever I want. But all things edify not. Now wait. The liberty you have is powerful enough that you can do whatever you want. And you will not lose your salvation. You can drink. You can smoke. You can do whatever you want. You can murder somebody. And if you're saved, you'll be saved after. But just because you can do it doesn't mean you ought to do it. And just because you can do it doesn't mean you should do it. You can smoke if you want to. You can drink. Listen, we're not that legalistic after all. I'm saying you can do whatever you want. You can drink if you want to. You can fornicate if you want to. You can steal if you want to. You can be immodest if you want to. You can be carnal if you want to. And none of that will touch your salvation. But every bit of that will hinder your walk with Christ and hurt a lot of other people loses its identity and in that it takes up the cross and says not me but Christ I am not primarily a father I'm primarily a Christian I'm not primarily a husband I am primarily a Christian I am not primarily a preacher I'm primarily a Christian I am not the money I make I'm a Christian. I am not the house I live in. I'm a Christian. I am not the car I drive. I'm a Christian. I am not the clothes I wear. I'm a Christian. I am not the party affiliation that I vote for. I am a Christian and I'm glad that I'm under grace and I'm grateful for my liberty. But Lord, God help me not to use it as a stumbling block to those around me. There's a lot of things I can do that aren't illegal. There's a lot of things I can do the culture's okay with. There's a lot of things I can do that you might not even think are wrong, but it might hinder my walk with God and it might hurt other people. My purpose is not to see, I'll say it again and I'm going to give you a few points, is not to run as close to the edge as possible without falling off. My purpose is to run as close to Christ as I can. Expediency. All right, let's look at chapter number 10. When you look at chapter number 10, there's some things I want us to consider. 
First, let's go back to chapter number six. I want you to see this. Let me give you a few things you need to consider with your Christian life. Number one, consider the unbeliever. Look at chapter number six. We read this verse a minute ago. If you look in verse number 11, really back up to verse number nine, it says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves of mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, by the way, but you're washed, so you're different now. You're sanctified, you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And so Paul said, now here it is, because you're different now, think about this, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I'll not be brought under the power of any. What he's saying is this. He said, I have to consider in my Christian life that there are people in this world that are not saved. And every day I live by how I act and what I say and where I go and how I present myself, I am representing Christ to lost people. And the lost people that see how I live may reject the gospel because of my life. Isn't that a scary thing to consider that you might be just as saved as the Apostle Paul was saved, but you get out there and you say, I have liberty. I'll live how I want. If I want to drink Budweiser, I'm going to drink it. And you can. And you'll still go to heaven. if You, do. you can go with alcohol on your breath. He said, well, I'm going to smoke pot. Well, you can if you want to. But I'll tell you this. Some old drunk out there not saved sees you who's supposed to be a Christian drinking alcohol, sitting at a table with somebody else who's drinking alcohol, having a bottle of wine in your house. You think they're going to believe your gospel. They're going to say, if it's not big enough to change you it's probably not big enough to change me i'll say you get out there and live like the world why would the world want what you have if it can deliver you so here's what he said now you don't have to like it you don't have to be biblical that's your decision but the bible says this we had to consider those that are lost matthew 18 7 woe unto the world because of offenses for it must needs be that offenses come but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh Romans 14, 16, Romans is all, about, is all about responsibility. And it talks about this, let not then your good be evil spoken of. The preeminent tool in evangelism is a personal testimony. Amen. That's why there's things in the Bible about Christians dressing different. Because the Bible says we're to let our light shine. Light shine when the light, when the switch is flipped. That, that distinguishes us uh, so the world can look and say, they're not like us. There's something different there. And I'm not saying everybody who dresses right is right. But I will tell you this, it's real hard to be right and not dress right. Come on now, everybody all right? Is it all right? You okay? So th here's what it is. There's lost people out there. You got to consider that. You say, well, I don't like that. Yeah, it's because you're a baby. And I'm not being mean to you. I'm just being honest. We're spiritually immature. Living like that when we say, you know what? It's too hot out there. I'm wearing, I'm wearing shorts, no shirt, going out there and mow my grass. It's hot out there. Well, you're the biggest baby ever seen in my life. If you can't sacrifice a little humidity and sweat through an old T-shirt so that some lost fellow don't see you out there with your, oh my, saggy body like a manatee on a mower going down the road. I mean, good night, Lord. I mean, you get out there, they look at you and think, man, they, they're not sanctified. They're the same. It's, I can wear whatever I want, can I? I can I go to the gym every once in a while. I don't go to the gym in shorts and a tank top. I don't go anywhere in shorts. And I, you can do whatever you want to. I don't care. I'm not saying you can't. I'm just saying I'm wanting to make sure. Listen, I don't want to be a stumbling block to an unbeliever. I don't go down the road blasting Leonard Skinner in my car. Now, I mean, I, I might want to. I mean, I, I don't go down the road doing that. I don't do that. Why? Because somebody out there might be lost in here and say, well, I thought that fellow was a preacher. You know, I want to see them get saved, and I don't want to cripple the power of the gospel because I'm so wrapped up in my own wants. I got to consider the unbeliever. Wait a minute. Number two, I got to consider the weaker brother. We're going to talk about this for a minute. Chapter number eight. Look at chapter number eight, verse number four. We still got time. Don't worry. We'll get out on time. Chapter 8, verse number 4. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world. I like that. Paul said, hey, we got enough spiritual sense to know it's just a hunk of wood. It don't mean a thing. I know that. 
He says, I know that. We know that. There's nothing in the world. And that there is none other God but one. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods, many and lords, many, a lot of different little idols. But to us there is but one God. That is settled in our heart. The Father of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge. You listening to me now? Here's the issue. We're going to talk about something. Not everybody is on the same page. For some, with conscience of the idol under this hour, eat it as a thing offered unto an idol. And their conscience being weak is defiled. But meat commendeth us not to God. We know that. It don't matter if you eat bacon or not. If you eat fish for Lent, go I mean, whatever you want to. That does not make you spiritual or not spiritual. We know that. But... But, watch this, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse, but take heed. Lest by any means this, this understanding that you have, this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. Now, I want to keep reading. For if any man see thee which has knowledge sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish? That's big. For whom Christ died? You're going to kill the Christianity of a baby Christian because you want to dress how you want to? You're going to shipwreck the faith of a baby Christian because you want to go where you want to? Hey, you're going to knock somebody out of church because you want to listen to what you want to listen to and you don't care about anybody else? That is spiritual immaturity. And he said, hey, but when you so sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Church is just like a family. Not everybody in your home is the same age. Not everybody in your home is the same maturity level. And we deal with different people in different ways. I can have a conversation. I can maybe recommend a book to Randy Spencer Sr. to read that I wouldn't recommend to, to just name a young man and you don't want to call anybody up make you think I'm think lowly of it, but just a younger Christian that I wouldn't have them read. Because he could probably read it and has enough discernment and foundation to say, yeah, but that's, that, that statement there is Calvinistic, so I'm just going to pass it over. So I can talk to him about some things and show him some things I wouldn't show some weaker Christian because they might get hung up on that. Next thing we know, they're a Calvinist. Now listen, we used to, we used to preach against hard about going to the movies. And, and we get a lot of kickback on that now. And here's why, because everybody's a hypocrite. We all have it in our house. We know that. Welcome to confession tonight. Isn't that right? So you really sound like an idiot when you say, bless God, you ought not be watching movies because we know that you have a phone. But I can give you a principle for not going to a theater. Because I don't know, I can control things in my house. Isn't that right? I can turn it off. I can, I can throw it out. I can, you know, we can, we can filter things in the house. I can't control that theater. So when I go to that theater, I am at the whim of the theater. That's one point. The other point is this. They don't just show one movie. They show ten. And so the devil's looking for a reason to give anybody doubt. If I walk in a theater to go watch a good movie, if there is such a thing, they're going to assume I'm watching the R-rated one down the hall. They're not going to give me the, the liberty to come and say, no, I'm going to watch the, the G thing down here, the, 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 the kid movie. They're going to say, no, he went down there to that R-rated movie. You say, yeah, but I want to watch a movie. That's baby Christianity. So what do we do? I'd like to see that. Well, maybe so. But I'm not going to go see it. You know why? Because I don't want to shipwreck somebody else's faith. Come on now. That's why I don't, I'll, 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 that's why I don't go preach in bars. Now I'll preach to a drunk, but I won't preach in his bar. I won't do that. I heard an old preacher, he's dead now, said, I'd go in a bar, bless God, and preach. I wouldn't. Because you, you don't trust me enough to do that. If you drive down the road and see me going into it, you say, doesn't, doesn't that drunk need the gospel? Sure he does. You got to come to church. We have it all the time. You say, hey, what about that? If I go in that bar and you drive down the road, what are you going to do? You're going to think he's going in there to drink. And the next thing you know, the rumor mill begins to run and the whole world thinks, well, he's going in there to drink. Like a Bob Jones graduate. You know, he's going in there to drink. And that's what you're going to think. So you know what? I don't do that. He says, is there anything wrong with you walking in there? I think there is. But even if we say he's not going in there to drink, hey, listen, just the appearance of evil is enough to keep me out of there. 
That's the reason why it's so important that some of you ladies, hey, you dress consistently because there are younger Christians and you men too, all of us, right? It's consistency. I said this at a youth meeting, so I guess I can say it's a bunch of old people too. The only time I put on a uniform growing up was to play a game. If I was going to play basketball or play football, I'd put on a uniform. Someday I don't just put on a uniform to go play a game with God. We don't dress one way on Sunday and a different way throughout the week. Why is that? Because it shows inconsistencies in our life. Everybody, it's getting really quiet on Wednesday night. Nobody's perfect on this and nobody's arrived. We're all trying to work on it if you want to glorify God. How are you going to sit there and teach somebody modesty on a Sunday and then not practice it through the week? Isn't that right? I mean, honestly, isn't that just right? And I'm not even being ugly about it. I'm just saying that's just how it is. Come on now. If nobody knew you and they just saw the picture, would they think that you're a Sunday school teacher? Or a choir member? Or a soul winner? Here's what I ask about the weaker brother. And I'll close. Here's what I say. I can do this. I have liberty. I can. Number two, I have to ask myself, I can do it, all right? Number two, I'm comfortable doing it. If I'm comfortable doing it, all right. Are you comfortable doing it? But then number three, watch this. I have to be able to say, I'm, I can do it. Maybe I'm even comfortable doing it. But here's spiritual maturity. But I won't do it because it might offend somebody else. You see, that's crazy. That's crazy. That's charity. That's loving others. We go to hotels all the time. I don't get in a swimming pool at the hotel. And I'm not against swimming, but I don't want somebody to see me in a swimming pool. All right, all right. Consider the weaker brother. Number three, I'll, I'll consider the church. Look at chapter 10, verse number 32. Chapter 10, verse number 32. See what it says? Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. When we're talking about our liberty, you can do whatever you want to do, but you've got to remember there's a church behind you. And everything you post and everything you get involved in, it reflects on the church that you go to. So I have to ask myself the question, is the thing that I'm involved in contradicting the doctrine of my church? Is the thing I'm involved in contradicting the principles that we preach? Is what I'm involved in going to tarnish the name of my pastor? Is what I'm doing right now going to bring shame to the body that I'm a part of? Don't you see this as so big? Because, listen, if we do that, how many folks won't get saved that might have? How many folks won't get right that could have? How many folks are going to never get in here and get a foundation of the Word of God? So what the Christian does, not, the Christian, not just a saved person, but a Christian, what they do is they crawl up on a cross and say, you know what, I'm going to die to some of these things that I'm allowed to do, but probably aren't going to help folks if I get involved in it. So I'm going to say, you know what, I won't do it. And here it is. If you want to do it, go ahead and do it. But that don't mean you have to post it either. Say, hey, man, I mean, go ahead and do it. If you want to do it, go ahead and do it, but don't flaunt it. Just keep it to yourself. you got to consider the weaker brother. Consider the church. Consider the Savior. Ask yourself, does this please Christ? Does this exemplify Him? Does this draw folks to Him? Would Jesus bless this if I asked Him to bless what I'm doing? And if not, then I need to stay away. And here it is, for we must all appear for the judgment seat of Christ. It's a hard thing. And I, what, I, what, I, what I'm talking to you about tonight is not just something that I, I would say here. I'll say it anywhere. We are losing this thing if we're not careful. Because we're getting too wrapped up in, well, I can and I want to. And we know it's not right. And the problem is we want to act like we're spiritual when we're growing more and more carnal. I promise you, I never preached something to anybody else that God didn't preach to me first. If we look at our life, we're looser than, if we look at our life, we are, I am looser than I was 10 years ago. I can guarantee it. I'm looser than I was 18 years ago when I started. I guarantee I was harder than I am right now. And why is it the more truth we learn, the softer we get? When it ought to be, the more truth we learn, the more established we become. I pray God to use it in your life like he has in mine. And listen, you're not my Pope and I'm not yours. But the Holy Spirit is our guide 
He lives within us. Amen. And if every day you'll give him a chance to direct you, I promise you this, he will help you. And he will convict you. And he will conform you. And God help it to be so. I'll close. I'll tell you one thing. The church, they were different. And I needed something different. Let's pray. God, I pray you'd help us tonight. Thank you for the Bible. I pray that, God, what was said was said in the right spirit. And I pray, God, that you'd help us tonight, God, to be God Christians. God, to desire to be holy and blameless and to glorify you. Thank you for our church. A lot of strong Christians in this church. And God, I pray we'd be good examples for the younger generation. A good example for our area as well. And ambassadors for Christ in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's do this. Let's stand to our feet if you would. We'll get a song. Whenever you're ready, Brother Cam, you can sing a verse of it. If you want to come pray tonight, it's a Wednesday night. We just call